Good morning. Glad you could join us here at the virtual dimension of Living Springs Fellowship here in Gallup. And, um, and if you couldn't be here with us on Sunday, well, we're thankful that God has afforded us the means and the opportunity to be able to bring you the Word of God in this, um, according to this particular modality over the internet. So I pray that, um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray and ask you, Lord God, to bring your word today in the demonstration and the power of your spirit. Lord, Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so, Lord, we are here today because we are hungry. And so we come to sit at your feet, Lord, and, and to learn of you and to learn directly from you. And we're grateful that you promised that when the spirit of truth came, that he would lead us into all truth. That he would take what is yours and declare it to us. And as you said, Jesus, he would not only be with us, but be in us so that you would be with us. And so we thank you, Lord, that your spirit who searches the mind of Christ, who knows the deep things of God, the, the one who is able to open the eyes of our understanding so that we can freely desire, receive all that you desire to freely make known to us, Lord, would, would teach us. So, Lord, we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us. You are the teacher, Lord God, and we thank you for your grace. May your grace abound to us today, Lord, that your word, Lord God, would accomplish what you would, that would go forth and do what you will and not return void. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to continue our study through the uh, book of 2 Corinthians. But you know, I want to begin with a, a particular verse that we've been beginning with, you know, almost every week while we've been in this particular section in chapters 8 and 9 that really deals with giving, okay? And so to set the stage for it, um, chap 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 and 8 says, okay, tells us, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. You know, it's not because you have to, not because you're obligated to, okay? Um, but it says, because God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, if you're not a cheerful giver, God doesn't like that. I mean, he doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't please him at all. You'd probably be better off not to give at all if you, you know, didn't just give out of your own heart and do it cheerfully. So, the thing, second thing it tells us is the fact that it says that God is able then. If, if, you know, if there's any question about, well, what are we giving out of? It says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. You know, and it makes me think of that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, that says, you know, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all, all things become new in him. So everything is different. Every, the way we live, the way we think, the, the way things operate in our lives, because it goes on to say at the beginning of verse 18, it says, because now all things are of God. Not of us, not of the world, not the way we think, but I mean, we're talking God here, okay? God's stuff. Now, the thing about 2 Corinthians, and I've talked about this quite frequently in this series, is the fact that it's a handbook, if you will, a handbook. Handbooks offer, you know, really practical, applicable stuff that you can do. It tells you how to do things, okay? Uh, it's easy, I know, that with the Holy Spirit, you know, we'll snap our fingers or sing songs a certain way or get some particular guy who preaches a certain way, who, you know, maybe hyperventilates enough that, you know, it's like Shazam, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts doing stuff. That's, I mean, when you read 2 Corinthians, you realize well, that this is a handbook because this is telling us how the Holy Spirit leads in and work through the lives of God's people, those who are born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus. Practical handbook that lays out the real life, practical applications, practices, if you will, of living to serve for the testimony of Jesus. Whereby, well, the leading in the work of the Holy Spirit is, you know, then and can be fully realized in and through each of our lives. And as a result, 
corporately together in and through the church. People are always saying, well, why don't we have that today? Why aren't we seeing the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives and in the church like he did in the book of Acts? Well, maybe we need to get back to the Bible. Maybe we need to get back to the practical stuff. Maybe we need to learn, okay? You know, I've been a... My 42 years as a Christian, as a follower of Christ... I've always believed and embraced all of the biblical promises concerning the Holy Spirit's presence, his leading, and his work in and through the lives of his people. The spiritual gifts, I mean everything. So, you know, I suppose you could call me a Baptocostal charismatist if you want, whatever. I don't really care, okay? But, you know, I never really learned for most of my Christian life, the practical applications are the ways really that, that the leading in the Holy Spirit is to be realized in and through the lives of not just the few of the, you know, super anointed elite, but really all of us. And, you know, uh, the thing is, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the way he's handled often in many churches today, it's the fact that, you know, it's kind of like giving somebody the keys to the car and say, hey, here's a key for the car. Go out and drive it. Well, if they've never been taught how to drive, you know, it's like they, they, they turn it on and they put it in gear and, and say, take off down the street. You can count on some, some crazy stuff that's going to happen. So, yeah, 2 Corinthians is a valuable and it really it's an essential handbook, okay? that lays out the practical applications, how the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit can be realized in through really each of our lives and in the church in ways that touch and bless others around us with a credible living testimony to the resurrection, love, the life, and the power of Jesus Christ. Now, mind you, uh, the, like I said, this isn't your typical pie-in-the-sky spirituality that, like I said, some tend to associate with the Holy Spirit these days instead. Like I said, we're talking real-life principles, practical things to apply, whereby the leading in the work of the Holy Spirit now transcends literally every dimension of our physical existence in the here and now. As, well, I mean, we see in the Bible was so proun- profoundly evident not only in the life and the ministry of Jesus, who is our teacher and really the model we're to follow, but the first apostles and, and the early church who followed his example in their place and in their time. In other words, just let me put it this way. This right here, 2 Corinthians chapters 8, 9, actually all of 2 Corinthians for that matter, this is how it happens. This is how it happens in the life of any truly born of the Spirit child of God in Christ Jesus. Which is precisely why, you see, it's recorded here for our benefit. Here in the inspired canon of Scripture, the Word of God. As Jesus himself declared in Matthew 4, verse 4, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word it proceeds from the mouth of God. So, you know, like I was praying this morning, how many of you are seriously hungry this morning, okay? I mean, I would assume that's why you're watching, because that's basically what we're into here at the Springs. So currently, as I said, we're working through chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians that deal with the principles of, of New Testament giving, okay? Which... Everything else here in 2 Corinthians is vitally essential to truly realizing the leading and the work in and through our lives of the Holy Spirit. And on, therefore also corporately as the church. I mean, together, all of us, individually and yet corporately, as we're told in Romans 12, verses 4 through 5, for we have many members in one body, or as we have many members in one body, I'm looking at them here, but... All the members do not have the same function. Well, talking now about the church, it says, so we, together, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Listen, we talk about the church. We talk about the witness, the testimony of the church here in this life, in our appointed place and time. 
This isn't a one man, two man, or even a several man show. I mean, that's not God's design for either our lives or our fellowship as his church. This is all of us individually living to serve for the testimony of Christ and the overflowing life of love and the power of his spirit. And I say it again, all of us put us together, man. What do you got? The corporate body of those. Redeemed out from among the world unto God, having really, I mean, turned from ourselves and, and all else to commit our hope, our lives, our faith and destiny to Jesus instead. And have been sealed then unto God by the indwelling of his spirit. So we can live this wonderful new life in Christ where, as we saw, I talked about that in 2 Corinthians um, 5 verse 18, where all things now, all things are of God. I mean, is that, the, is that what you want? Well, if you're in 2 Corinthians, man, you're in the right book. Okay. Now, if you can accept that, that as God's place for you in his scheme of things. You know, as an individual member of the body of Christ, one through whom God wants to lead and work by the power and the life and love of his Holy Spirit. And as a result, like the believers at Macedonia, we talked about there in the first seven verses in chapter eight, you know, you're totally up for getting in on the fellowship of ministering to the saints, as, you know, Paul told us about those Christians. You see it there in your Bibles back in verses 3 and 4. He said, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Because, I mean, the... You know, the fellowship of the ministering, the serving the saints, this really is where meaningful and fulfilling Christian fellowship is realized. And a lot of Christians and churches today are totally missing out on it. Serving one another out of the grace that God pours in and through our lives for this very purpose. So if you're one of those who's up for that, like the uh, believers at Macedonia that Paul was talking about, then I'm pretty sure you're going to want to totally get into these principles, okay, revealed and taught in these particular chapters and verses that we're into now that deal with New Testament giving. So let's get up to speed for our text today, okay? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8 through 9. Let's read those. Paul says to the believers at Corinth, whom this letter was initially addressed to, but I believe being inspired by the Spirit is written to you and I today. Okay, so let's take it like that. He's talking to us. Okay, he says, I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you do. I mean, if you're a Christian, okay, that... Though he was rich, I mean, the guy was, he's the second person of the Trinity, the Godhead. He said, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty, we might become rich. That through his poverty, we might become rich. Now, we covered these verses in our previous study where Paul had previously testified. Like we said in the opening verses of chapter 8, how the churches in Macedonia, and in spite of being poor and enduring a great trial of affliction, eagerly gave. They just gave for the relief of their suffering brethren at Jerusalem. He said, as you saw, not only as they were able at the time, and you think it will be in poverty, and on top of that, enduring a great trial of affliction, But they did it above and beyond their own ability. Above and beyond what they themselves were able. And as a result of that, giving out like that, they came to realize for themselves the incredible joy of seeing the riches of God's boundless grace miraculously supplied and poured out in and through their lovingly yielded lives to, to bless, to serve, and encourage, and relieve 
the fellow, their fellow brethren in Christ who were in need. And doing it in real living and tangible testimony to the resurrection life and the power of Jesus Christ in and through his people, the church. Now it's important to point out that Paul, he put it like this to the Corinthians church. You see here at the very beginning, as he's talking about this, he says, he tells him, he says, I'm not commanding you. I'm not commanding you to do this. Okay? I'm not commanding you to step up and do what they did. I'm not commanding you to give. I mean, we talked about this already. That would be manipulation by shame or guilt. What does it say? About God loves a cheerful forgiver. So, you know, let each man give as he determines in his own heart. Not grudgingly and not because he has to. Okay. So uh, Paul's saying, I'm not commanding you. Because otherwise th that would totally, that that'd screw everything up. That, that would corrupt the whole thing. And you see that that's not what those first seven verses are all about. When he talks about the, the believers in Macedonia. Rather he continued, he said, what I'm doing is testing or proving the sincerity of your love by the example of others. And you say, well, well, isn't that like intimidation or manipulation? Well, no, I don't think so because, you see, as Christians, I think it's important that we do evaluate ourselves. It's important that we, you know, we apprise ourselves of the very motives of our heart and the things behind the things we're doing. And, I mean... We need to take stock of ourselves. Take heed to ourselves, okay? So he's saying, what I'm doing is, I'm, here's a little test for you guys to prove the sincerity of your love by the example of others. And we talked about this last week, the fact that, you know, that, that's important. We, we shouldn't be judging ourselves by ourselves, <laughs> okay? That, that's really not a good standard to go by. So as you saw in our text here today that he pointed them to Jesus, who demonstrated God's love for us by freely and willingly becoming poor for our sake. In other words, allowing himself to be totally poured out for us so that we can inherit the riches of God through him. Listen, so here's the thing. Jesus not only expressed his desire to do it, as he told his disciples in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said, for even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But he carried through with it to the point it cost him his life on a cross. As he himself explained in John 15 verse 13, where he said, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Essentially, really, you know, we talk about different things. We talk about standards. You often hear, maybe you've heard the term used before, that, you know, here's the gold standard. In other words, man, this is it. This is the gold standard. This is, you know, it's perfect. Well, basically what this did is it made Jesus the perfect, even better than that, Jesus the perfect God standard. By which you and I, who claim to be his followers, right? Isn't that what a Christian is? Someone who wants to be like Jesus? A disciple, somebody who, who seeks to follow and apply the teachings of life and the example of, of, of their teacher, that being Jesus. So yeah, I think he really, he is the standard by which you and I need to honestly and humbly evaluate the love that we profess both for God as well as one another. Because, I mean, really here it is laid out for us in black and white in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where we're told it says, by this we know love. I mean, this is, this is how you tell if it's a real deal. This is how we know love because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And to lay down your life for the brethren doesn't mean that we're going to do what Jesus did because only, only Jesus could do what he did to fulfill all the righteousness of the law and then and, uh, by get the giving of his life and the shedding of his sinless blood atoned for the sins of all of us. No. Us laying down our lives for the brethren, when you lay down your life for somebody, it means that you put them first. You put yourself beneath them. It's like, yeah, you put them first. You're going to serve them. 
okay? Because it goes on to say, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother, his brother in Christ in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You see, because what we see in Jesus is the inescapable truth that sincere love has to translate into action. So, you see, Paul now, he doesn't command, rather he advises. And I think everything that's written in the Bible here in regards to New Testament giving is given to us as advice. It's important because let each give as he has purposed in his own heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. That's New Testament giving, okay? And you know, really, the thing with advice is this. It's really only as effective as what you choose to do with it. What you choose to do with it. So I kind of lay that at your feet this morning as we are reading these passages, okay? As we're getting into the Word of God. You see, first of all, Paul reminds the believers at Corinth, okay, of the fact that, as he put it, he said, you've, you've begun, you, you've already begun this giving thing. Actually, really a year before the church of Macedonia gave their love offering. Having taken that essential first step, as we already know, applies to New Testament giving. Here it is. Let each one gives as he purposes in his own heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And telling them next that, he says, now it's, it's to your advantage to set about getting it done so as to bring that desire they had once expressed to, to fruition or completion so that it accomplishes what it's supposed to. Check it out. Let's look at verses 10 through 11 here in our text today, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul writes to them, he says, and, this I give in, and in this I give advice, okay? It's to your advantage not only to be doing what you began. In other words, the, 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 let's just let's start, let's get it this done. And we're desiring to do, as he said a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire... Yet, he goes on to say, so there also may be a completion of what you have. So he says, it's, this is to your advantage. I'm, I, I give you this advice now. You, I mean, you, you, now it's yours. You've you got you to do something with it. It's, it's up to you what you do with it. But he says, here's the deal. It, it's, it's actually to your advantage. What's he getting at? Well, I'll, I'll put this to you guys, Okay. How many of you are, are serious? I mean, serious about realizing the riches and the joy of being the yielded vessels of God's abundant grace and provision to others and living testimony to the resurrection of Christ's spirits leading and working through your own life? Moreover, hey, here's, here's another one. Here's another one as far as being to your advantage. How many of you are, are willing to Willing to actually prove yourself. To, to prove the sincerity and the truth of the love that you profess for God and others. Say, for instance, hey, the songs that you lift up to God every Sunday. Remembering the admonition given to all of us. In 1 John 3, verses 18 and 19. Where it says, the word of God says, my little children, let us, let us not live in word or in tongue. It says, but in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth. And by this we know. This, we're going to prove. By this we know or prove that we are of the truth. We're not hypocrites. We're not two-faced. We're not shallow. Believers that just, you know, are into the substanceless vanity of mere rituals and stuff like that, okay? And he says, and assure our hearts before him, before the Lord. I mean, really, you know, the thing is I've found in my own life, one of the things that is really, truly humiliating, that really, really 
cuts to me to the very heart. It's when I have made a commitment to somebody to do something for them, do something for them, and I never did it, never followed through on it, and then I run into them somewhere, you know? It's like, I want to run and hide. Just the sight of them and the fact that, you know, I'm going to have to face them is enough to make me like go, <laughs> yeah, I'm convicted. I mean, is that the way you want to really have to consider that, you know, God's looking at you like, oh, come on, you and your songs and all your professions and all this stuff. What are you going to really mean what it is that you say? <laughs> and it's going to reflect in your life in a way that, you know, others can be blessed by. So you see, I think that does. That, that explains why, yeah, it is to our advantage. That the desire of our heart, especially when it comes to the love we profess for God and others, translate into tangible living action or deeds. Now, if that scares you, hopefully the next verse will put your mind at ease, okay? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12 because Paul says, he says, for if there's first a willing mind, okay, I, I, I want to do this. And that is accepted. God says, okay, great. That's great. It is accepted, it says, according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. So in other words, well, let's just go on a little bit here. First of all, God would never expect any of us to give, whether we're talking about the things that we can and should give out of time, abilities, effort, or resources, out of which that which he has chosen to, to graciously pour into our lives. I mean, we all have it, right? The point being, if God's given it to you, and this is the deal, okay? If God's given it to you, you look, he doesn't expect us to give out of what he hasn't given to us. If God's given it to you, you have it. Whatever it may be, your time, your ability, resources, maybe your calling, your spiritual gifts, then give out of that. That's what God expects. I mean, if you, if you could tell him, I want to do this, and you're singing, you know, I love you, Lord, and I'm going to serve you and all this stuff or whatever, you know, every Sunday. Then God's looking at you, he's going, okay, I've given you this. What you say you're going to do, God's like, okay, all right. Let's, <laughs> well, okay. You see, that's what living to serve for the testimony of Christ is all about. It, it's, it, it, and it is, it is how the Holy Spirit leads and works in and through the lives of you and I as his children, God's children in Christ. It's like I said, we're not talking about some kind of pie in the sky spirituality here. Rather, as you can tell from the word of God that we're into today, that it's all very simple and entirely practical. And the best part is giving out of what God has given to us blesses the lives of others, listen, in ways none of us could ever imagine. <laughs> you don't believe me? Get a load of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we even ask or think, and in some versions it says could even imagine, it says according to the power that works in us, that's the spirit who's been given to us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Telling you, man, God is able to do things in and through each of our lives that is above and beyond anything we can even ask or imagine. And it will bring, it will bless others and in the process of which it will bring glory to Christ. It will testify of the resurrection life, the love and the power of Christ in us. That's what we've been, that's, that's why we're, we were left here in the world, right? But I, I mean, again, I just emphasize this. The fact that it said, according to the power that works in us. In us, not some of us, but all of us who 
are truly born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I say that because I know that there are people who look to someone like me standing up here behind the pulpit and they think, hey, hey, that's your job, pastor, to do all that God stuff. Come on, perform. <laughs> but you know, actually, it's, that's not my job. My job, as pertains really to all of the fivefold ministry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12 explains, it says, and he, that meaning the Lord himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So that would be guys like me. It says, listen to this, for the equipping of the saints, that'd be you guys, for, in other words, to do the work of the ministry. So as to edify and build up the body of Christ. I know a lot of pastors are hired with the expectation that they're going to build a church. And they're going to, they're going to increase the giving. And they're going to get people to do stuff. That's not how it works. That's not the biblical model. That is that's the calling and responsibility of, of all Christians, each and every one of us, to be a part of the body of Christ for that purpose. So again, yeah, it is, it's totally up to each one of us to willingly and lovingly allow the Holy Spirit to lead and work in through our lives as we willingly and selflessly give out of that which God has chosen to give and thereby provide through us, whether it be time Effort, abilities, spiritual gifts, calling, resources, be it any combination or all of the above. Which explains, really, I think the profound significance of Acts chapter 20, verse 35, where it is written. Where it says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. So this is the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And again, you know, it, it takes you back to what Paul said, the fact that it really is to our advantage to act on our professions of love and desire to give. Now, in closing this morning, I call your attention to the two specific prompts, again, that Paul was using. These are prompts, okay? I mean, the Word of God is full of exhortation, and that's what exhortation is. Exhortation prompts us, then, you know, to take what we're learning, what we're reading, and then, you know, to act on it. Okay, so there were two specific prompts, really, I think, that were purposely inspired by the Holy Spirit to exhort each one of us regarding these principles of New Testament giving. Giving that, yes, it is essential to realizing the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit and through each of our lives. Now, recall the words that he used. Remember? I do not command but rather advise you. This is it, man. This is the word of God, and this is advice. What you do with it is your responsibility. And, and then you have Romans 12, verses 1. Here's another one. Where the Holy Spirit, through Paul, listen to this, pleads with us. Do you ever think of the Holy Spirit? This is God, man, pleading with us. Where he pleads with us says to present our bodies as a living sacrifice saying here's my body God take it and use it as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to him and Jesus makes that possible and again we're talking about giving this time in terms of really what constitutes a life of true and spiritual worship through loving service to God and others versus empty forms and mere rituals that can become a convenient substitute, I find. So here's the question, okay? Why would the Holy Spirit advise rather than command you and I, especially when it comes to principles that are absolutely essential to realizing his leading and work in and through our lives and fellowship? Well, 
You know, in the Old Testament, under the law, that was handed down from God to ancient Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai, the people were told, literally commanded concerning every detail of what, how much, and when they were required, and I emphasize that word, required to give. How would you like to operate under that? Under those constraints. But fortunately, however, all of that goes away in the New Testament. As Colossians chapter 2 verse 4 informs us that Jesus, through his sinless life, atoning death, literally it states, wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. Out of the way. I mean, removed it out of the way. For what? Well, a whole new and more perfect order and dispensation and the fulfillment of God's plan for the ages. Something that Paul refers to, or actually the writer of Hebrews is, is something better, more perfect. Which is why we call it the New Testament. So, how's this New Testament business of giving supposed to work? That's what we're into today, okay? When it comes to those who are truly born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus, well, New Testament giving is based on a biblical principle called liberty. I'm going to repeat that again. This is so important. You get this, okay? Liberty. Not freedom, mind you. Okay, we've been freed from sin. We've been freed from the law. But now that's been taken away to replace by something better. And it tells us that it's liberty. Liberty. Galatians 5 verses 13 and 14 informs those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, it says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Not freedom. You've been called to liberty. Only don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, you know, just to, just to fulfill your own selfish desires and passions, ambitions, and agenda. But it says, through love, serve one another. For all of the law, if the law is taken out of the way, okay, the thing that replaces it is so much better. It says, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus went one step further with those who are his. He says, and you shall love one another, he said, as I have loved you. Yeah, that's our God standard, man. In other words, you see, liberty, the liberty that you and I have been given in Christ essentially replaces the ordinances of the law with the blessed opportunity to choose for ourselves, to choose for ourselves to think and conduct our lives and our affairs with a greater regard for the good of others. Because, yeah, we're talking love here now, which is what the Holy Spirit brings to a believer's life. It's the first and the preeminent thing that he brings to our lives out of which springs everything else, okay, as we choose to lovingly give ourselves over to his leading in our lives as opposed to allowing ourselves to be governed by the old sinful, selfish nature of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 3.17 explains, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. So we're talking the Lord, God, Jesus. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and listen to this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, where He's leading, where He's guiding, where He is the governing factor, He says, there is liberty. See, in church, if the Spirit of the Lord is truly running things in the church, if, he's, if we're letting him run things, look, we're not all going to be in to do our own things. And, it's, and, and what we come to church for is not just going to, it's not going to be about us, about my glory and what I get out of it and all this stuff and what I expect and what I want, what I demand, what I'm entitled to. Where there's liberty... The spirit is there's liberty, and where there's liberty, the thing that's governing our life is it's going to be our concern for serving the good of one another, making New Testament giving not something we're required to do, but rather something we desire to do 
purely out of the love which Romans 5, 5 reveals is being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. And as a result, we'll present an undeniable, tangible, living evidence of the Spirit's leading and working and through our lives and fellowship that, that quite literally touches and blesses others around us. And face it, there's no greater living testimony. Forget about the canned evangelistic approaches. Forget about the tracts and handing those things out and going around beating people up with the Bible and all this stuff. There is no greater living testimony for the love, the life, and the transforming power of the risen Savior in and through our lives at fellowship than that. Which brings us to our closing scripture this morning. It's something that Jesus said that I pray will stick with you, will haunt you, will constantly just speak to you, the still small voice of God's spirit within you. If you're one of those who's truly born of the spirit, a child of God in Christ Jesus, it will stick with you. I pray from the moment I step away from this pulpit. It's Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. And this is Jesus talking here. This is Jesus. He says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. He said, freely you have received, freely give. I'm thinking, wow, that's heavy. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Now, now, that's some serious God stuff. That's the stuff that we, we kind of think, well, only certain people can do that. The only the, the hyper-anointed spiritual elite, <laughs> these guys, you know, that parade around on stage and perform behind the pulpit, you know, um, we're rendering all of us a little more than just mere spectators, the ones who receive, <laughs> and we wonder why we're not getting blessed, okay? No. See, this is, this is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to all of us. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. And the reason why I just, you know, I think he throws that at us. is like, this is, he throws down the gauntlet here, man. Pulls out all the stops. I mean, like I said, the, the, that's some serious God stuff. Remember, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have been passed away. All things have become new in him. Now all things are of God. And I asked you, that's what you want? Well, there you go. However, notice the operative word that Jesus uses here. It all hinges on this. Freely. Freely you have received. If God's given it to you, he says then, freely give. Not because you have to, but because you want to. And then because you want to, then you do it. You give. That is how it works. Pure and simple. It can't be any more simple, clear, and practical than that. That's it, man. That's the key to the Holy Spirit's leading work in and through our lives in ways that, that, that testify in a very open, visible, tangible way that can touch the lives and the hearts of people around us. Which I think now pretty much leaves the ball in your court. <laughs>